Hello, good evening and welcome to a new episode of Arguably the Reading Quest. I am Nishant. As you know, I have done a series on the greatest philosophical novels of all time. It was a series on four of four episodes. I have done Self-Help Book and The Great Sham. It was a series of three episodes. Similarly, I thought of doing a series on newer writings. Now, what kind of newer writings? Let me tell you. So, in French, there is a word popular these days as uh, based on my talks with some of the French scholars and professors from India. So, they told me that there is a term uh, that is called extreme contemporary. Pardon my French. Uh, it is extreme contemporary. That in loosely in English translates as extremely contemporary or the ultra contemporary. So, I thought of starting a series, an ongoing series. This will not be a series of just four episodes. This will be an ongoing series where I will discuss the newer writings. But to give you a background, what are the criteria on which the books will be picked up? So, we'll be doing largely fiction here in this, in this series, in the multiple episodes. So, extent contemporary is strictly speaking for 10 years, as my uh, professor friends told me. Contemporary literature courses generally take into account writings of the last 40 years. Contemporary history goes on to 50 years. But contemporary, you know, can also be uh, employed as a term of one's own time. For example, we can say Shakespeare's contemporaries. We can say Aristotle's contemporaries. Right. The notion of contemporary history uh, in most cases goes on to 50 years, but there are no, there is no consensus regarding this. However, Strictly speaking, the ultra-contemporary writing, as is uh, common in uh, the French-speaking countries, is strictly for 10 years. But what I have decided is that 10 years will be too short a period. So, let's keep it, uh, you know, from 2000 onwards, which means the writings of 21st century. So, it will be a span of 24 years and continuing. So, I'll be discussing all those uh, important, iconic, lesser-known, obscure, famous, uh, very original writers uh, who, who matter in, these, uh, in, in the new millennium. So, I'll be discussing one book every episode of this ultra-contemporary writings series. And the series is titled The Ultra-Contemporary Writing. So, this is the background of the of the episode, the series that I'm going to do. Now, uh, for a long time, I had this misplaced notion that nothing more can be written on sorrow. What else can we write more on sorrow? After reading so much of Dostoevsky and Tolstoy and almost uh, as many philosophical novels as possible, all the existentialist tradition from the West all the realistic writing from uh, almost all the realistic writing, I'll not say all the realistic writing, all the writings on realism as much as possible from East and from here, there and everywhere. I had somehow this misplaced notion that everything and possibly everything on sorrow has been written, but I was wrong. So let me introduce you to this book, The Physics of Sorrow. The Physics of Sorrow, it is written by... Gregory Gospodinov. So, Gregory Gospodinov is the winner of possibly every Bulgarian honor possible. He's a Bulgarian writer. And this book appears in the year 2012, 2012. And this book reaffirms Gorgi Gospodinov's place as Europe's most inventive and daring writers. So, here the sorrow, the, the, the motive is sorrow. The theme is sorrow that has been discussed from as many points as possible. But the most important of them all, the master motive, as I'll call it, the master motive is the motive of an abandoned child. So the story has been told from the perspective of abandonment. It is not grief. It is not uh, sorrowfulness. It is not the story of a crestfallen man. It is not the story of a man who is on the verge of existential angst. It is the story of a child who has been abandoned. So this was something so so original and so daringly new to me that that it was literally a mind-boggling thing for me to experience his writing. 
and I just finished reading it. So I thought of doing this episode for all of you. I hope you'll enjoy this. So just to give you a brief overview. So it is held together by a master motive. And the motive of what? The motive of the legend of Minotaur. I hope you have heard Minotaur some time or the other. So Minotaur is uh, the ancient Greek myth. It's a half man and a half bull creature. Which is seen as a monster in ancient literature. But this is an iconoclastic retelling of the story of Minotaur. Wherein Gorgi Gospodinov tells us that he was not a monster. Rather he was a half man and half bull who was born out of an illicit relationship. Uh, and, and he was abandoned by his mother. And then he chronicles possibly uh, a semi-fictional uh, chronicalizing of all the possible story of abandonment and what effect, what psychological effect it produces on a child. And, 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 and the story is beautifully, beautifully described. The characterization is so deep that you will feel as if they are living child in flesh and blood. They have their own sorrows, joys and suffering and you will feel for them. So... The writer challenges this assertion, of course, as I told you, with some kind of iconoclastic prison, with great equity and argues that Minotaur isn't a monster, but an abandoned child born of an illicit liaison through no fault of his own. But that is only the external theme as one of the critique observes. The novel internal themes of abandonment that leads to an acute sense of sorrow and the extent of sympathy required to examine and understand that sorrow and to eventually come to term with it are executed with perfection. There is a term that the writer of this novel uses where the story is about a writer who, uh, the story is about a boy who, who has so deep an empathy that he feels for, uh, you know, whatever uh, whatever story that disturbs him about other people. So much so that he goes into the mind of other people and he can clearly see through their pain and trauma and abandonment. And when he went to get examined himself to a psychiatrist, the psychiatrist termed it a very, uh, you know, spine-chilling disorder. Empathy, but the psychiatrist termed it as pathological empathy. So he was suffering from a disease called pathological empathy. I don't know whether such disease really exists in the Diagnostic Manual 4 of the American Association of Psychiatry or not. But this has been the term that is coined by the writer of this book. So, uh, and, and it is also sometimes referred to as the obsessive empathetic somatic syndrome. Obsessive empathetic somatic syndrome or a psychological empathy. So this allows the writer to explore various characters stressed across an entire century through a first-person perspective, which otherwise would have been technically difficult for our narrator. And the rich exploration of author's family, the Minotaur myth which I told you, the master motif here, the physics of elementary particle as the name itself signifies the physics of sorrow, the author's own melancholies, socialism, they show vegetarianism. Uh, and boredom in Bulgaria and quirky absent friends narrated in numerous novels in hilarious and moving voices retaining the fast-paced tail spinner feel throughout and entertaining from first to the last. Sage M.J. Nichols, one of the critique. I've, in order to give you a better feel of what to expect, I am reading a few excerpts from the book itself. I hope you'll enjoy it and, and, and I hope you will see the the intensity of his writing, which largely broaders on the theme of abandoned children. So there is this uh, chapter titled The Bread of Sorrow. So it goes like this. I see him clearly, a three-year-old boy. He has fallen asleep on an empty floor sack in the mill yard. A heavy bee buzzes close above him, making off with his sleep. The boy opens his eyes, just a crack. He's still sleepy. He doesn't know where he is. Now the story moves on to how he's abandoned. 
and his reaction when he discovered that he is abandoned. I open my eyes just a crack. I am still sleepy. I don't know where I am. Somewhere in the no man's land between dream and day. It is afternoon. Precisely that timelessness of late afternoon. The steady rumbling of the mill. The air is full of tiny specks of flour and slight itching of the skin. A yawn, a stretch. The sound of people talking can be heard. Calm, monotone, hailing, lulling. Several carts stand unyawed, half filled with sacks. Everything is sprinkled with that white dust. A donkey grazes nearby, his leg fettered with a chain. Now suddenly the child wakes up and he discovers that his mother isn't there. So the writer writes, His mother isn't here, nor any of his sisters. A hulking man stooped under a sack almost knocks him over. They holler at him to go outside. He is in the way. Mommy? Question mark. The first cry. It's not even a cry. It ends in a question mark. Mommy? Again question mark. The O, the letter O, lengthens. Since the discretion is growing as well. Mommy? Mommy? The question has disappeared. Hopelessness and rage. A crumb of rage. What else is in sight? Bewilderment? How could this be? Mothers don't abandon their children. This is not fair. This just doesn't happen. Abandon is a word he doesn't yet know. I don't yet know. The absence of the word does not negate the fear. On the contrary, it heaps up even higher, making it even more intolerable, crushing. The tears begin. Now it is their turn, the only consolers. At least he can cry. The fear has uncopped them. The picture of fear has run over. The streams, the tears stream down his face, down my face. They mix with the floor dust on the face, water, salt and floor and knead the first bread of grief. Please listen to this line once again, I'm repeating it. It's beautiful. The tears stream down his face, down my face. Because here the narrator is feeling for the abandoned child. As I told you, he's suffering from a disorder called pathological empathy. Hence the play with the word. The tears stream down his face, down my face. They mix with the floor dust on the face, water, salt and floor and Ned, the first bread of grief, the bread that never runs out. The bread of sorrow which will feed us through all the coming years. Please tell me in the comment section, have you uh, read anything even Remotely similar to this. Now another chapter reads, A short catalogue of abandonments. A short catalogue of abandonments. The history of the family can be described from the abandonment of several children. The history of the world too. The abandoned child with the bull's head, thrown into Minot's labyrinth. The abandoned Oedipus, the little boy with the pierced ankles, tossed on the mountainside in a basket. Remember in Mahabharata's story, Korn was also abandoned. Korn was an abandoned child. Who would be adopted first by King Polybus, later by Sophocles, and in the end by his later father, Sigmund Freud? The abandoned Hansel and Gretel, the ugly ducklings, the little match girl, the grown-up Jesus. She wants to go to her grandmother's house, he to his father's. He to his father's ear refer to Jesus. In this line come, even without lessons to back them up, all those abandoned now or in the past, and all those who shall be abandoned, having fallen from the manger of myth, let us take them in. In this inn of wars, spread beneath them the clean sheets of history, tuck in their frost-bitten souls, and leave them in hands, which, as they turn these pages, shall stroke their frightened backs and head. How many readers here have not felt abandoned at least once? Ask the writers. And this is a question to all of us. How many of us readers here have not felt abandoned at least once? How many would admit that at least once they have been locked in a room, a closet or a basement for edification? 
And how many would dare say that they have not done the locking up? In the beginning, I said, there is a child tossed into a cellar. One last excerpt that I would like to read from this book. And it is titled, dot, 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 and his story. I had to get away from her if I wanted to live. I had to leave her, leave the city in the most literal way. I wandered around Europe for several months. To forget a relationship, some try promiscuous sex. I tried promiscuous geography. This is the beauty of the writing that literature offers. Promiscuous geography. Now that requires a man of genius to have coined this phrase, promiscuous and geography together. A writer who simply is concerned or someone who is concerned only about the dictionary definition of a word could not ever have written a word or phrase something like promiscuous geography. I again repeat. To forget a relationship, some try promiscuous sex. I tried promiscuous geography. I picked cities at random, usually traveling by train. I changed stations and hotels and all other tourists were in group or couples. I wandered alone around the square, which at a certain point all started to look the same. I looked like a person who wanted to abandon his own abandonment around some corner, like someone looking for a distant and unknown place to release the cats of his sorrow, the cats of his sorrow so that they would never find a way home. Do you know how hard it is to get rid of cats? They possess an incredible homing instinct, astonishing memory. Once my grandpa tried to get rid of all the house cats that had multiplied in the house and yard. He stuffed them in a sack and let them go a few miles outside the town near the graveyard. When he got back home, the cats were already there waiting for him. That bit about the cats is a bonus. I didn't tell it to Rushdie. Rushdie is another character here. The storyteller said, taking a sip of his second four roses. So guys, I hope I have given you a glimpse of what to expect uh, in this book and why I have termed uh, and why I have really started this series called The Ultra Contemporary Writing. I also believe I sourced on YouTube and I believe that there are almost uh, lesser or almost no content available on ultra-contemporary writings, uh, at least insofar as uh, anyone from India is doing this content. I couldn't see that. So I thought of doing this to introduce uh, you guys to you know such kind of writings. If you've still not liked, shared and subscribed my YouTube channel, arguably The Reading Quest, please do that. Happy reading, guys. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.